Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. We do thank God for this Loyalty Sunday, for your presence here on this day, and for this stewardship season. We are grateful for all that God has done and for all that God continues to do in the midst of this parish. Today we look at Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. The Apostle Paul starts this passage by reminding the Thessalonians of the power of the evil one. He tells them not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by spirit or by word or by letter. For the day of the Lord will only come after the lawless one has been revealed for who he is. We too must remember not to be quickly shaken by the power of the evil one. Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. And so we must pray. We must pray that we might not be quickly shaken so that we might inherit this abundant life that God has promised. Prayer, you see, is key to our victories in this life. In this stewardship season, we must pray, yes. We must pray about the amount we will pledge and give for the coming year. We must pray for the continued vitality of this parish, that our level of ministry might not be diminished. We must pray for our children, our parents, and our spouses. We must pray for our friends and our neighbors, our commonwealth, and our nation. But there are some things you just don't have to pray about. You just don't. This reminds me of a story of the rector of a small parish who was called to a church where his salary would be four times what he was receiving at his current congregation. He was a very devout man, and so he spent many hours in prayer trying to discern God's will for him at this point in his life. Should he accept the call or stay where he was a little longer? One day, a friend of the family saw the rector's nine-year-old son playing in the street. And he said, well, Teddy, has your father made a decision about this new call? And the boy looked up at him and said, well, my dad's still praying, but my mom is packing. <laughs> As a matter of fact, my dad went to sit in his favorite chair last night and fell flat on the floor. In this passage, Paul says several other things that are worthy of our consideration. First, he says, we must always give thanks to God for you because God chose you as the first fruits for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. Two key words important to the understanding of Christian belief appear in this phrase, salvation and sanctification. Paul said that God chose them as the first among many who would come to know salvation through Jesus and sanctification through the Spirit. Salvation. What does it mean? To be saved is to be granted the promise of everlasting life in the presence of God. 
John said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. To be saved is to have the assurance that death is only the door to a larger life with God. And beyond that door, the wonders of the universe will be ours to explore and enjoy forever and forever and forevermore. Sanctification. What does it mean and why is it important? The Pentecostals often use the word sanctification. If you listen to their testimonies and their preaching, they often refer to the fact that they were sanctified by the Spirit and filled with the Holy Ghost. To be sanctified is to be set apart. Set apart for the work of the gospel. Set apart for the building of the kingdom. Set apart to glorify God in the lives we live and in the hope we profess. We are saved and sanctified for the glory of God. I always pray that what I say to you I say from my sanctified soul that you might be strengthened and encouraged, helped and healed, enlightened and edified. I say to you today from my sanctified soul that God wants the best for you. God wants you to live the highest life. God wants you to stand on the tallest mountain. God wants you to be strong and of good courage, for he has promised never to leave you or forsake you. The Lord said to Joshua, no one shall be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. Second, Paul says, for this purpose, he called you through our proclamation of the good news so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. You have been called to obtain the glory of Christ. Just as God called the Thessalonians to obtain the glory of Christ, we too have been called to obtain that same glory. It is not a glory intended for the apostles alone, or for the early church, or for the great names of the Bible, or the great names of history, but a glory also intended for us, intended for you and intended for me. And so we must ask ourselves, what is the nature of this glory? It is, is it rather the fame that arises from popularity or media coverage? Is it the fame that rises from the number of friends you have on Facebook or followers on Twitter or Instagram? The answer is no. I don't know anything about Snapchat or Pinterest, so I can't say anything about those. What is the nature of this glory? This glory is the power given to us to accomplish those things many have said could not be done. This glory is the power to achieve greatness through the good we do. This glory is the power to advance the causes of peace and justice, equality and fairness throughout the world. This is the glory we have been given. This is the glory you have been given. This is the glory I have been given. As I was 
writing this sermon, I turned to that passage in Joshua that I mentioned a moment ago. And I found a bookmarker from the National Museum of African American History and Culture. The bookmarker was about Ida B. Wells, also known as Ida B. Wells Barnett. Ida B. Wells was born during the Civil War and lived until 1931. The bookmarker says that Ida B. Wells is best known for her work with the anti-lynching campaigns. She began her activist work at the age of 22. She was an educator, a suffragist, and a journalist. She sued the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad Company after being forced to leave her first class seat in favor of a white man and was moved to a Jim Crow car. She won a judgment against the railroad, but the judgment unfortunately was later overturned on appeal by the Tennessee Supreme Court. But her fight for justice and equality, especially for women's rights, was only strengthened by this loss. She is known to us today because of that glory that had been given to her. Third, Paul says, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that were taught by us. In the midst of their challenges, the Thessalonians needed to be encouraged to hold fast to their new faith. We all find ourselves in times of great difficulty, times when we need to be encouraged to hold on to what we believe. This is especially important when it appears that God is not listening to our prayers or when our reality no longer seems to justify our beliefs. And so we cry out, if God is a God of love, why is this happening to me? If God is a God who answers prayer, why have my prayers not been answered? If God is a God who has promised never to leave me, why do I feel so abandoned? In the valley of our doubts, Paul instructs us to continue to believe. David said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Paul calls upon the Thessalonians to remember and to claim this comfort as their own. He also calls upon us to remember and to claim this comfort as our own. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate or another comforter to be with you forever. And finally, the apostle says, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and through grace gave us eternal comfort and good hope. Comfort your hearts and strengthen them in every good work and word. May God comfort your hearts and strengthen you in every good work and word. This was his prayer for the Christians at Thessalonica and it should be our prayer for each other. I pray that at this time in your life, God may comfort your hearts 
and strengthen you. Whatever your circumstances, whatever your dilemma, whatever your challenge, whatever your difficulty, I pray this prayer and invite you to pray this prayer for me as well. Only through prayer can we climb the great mountains before us. Only through prayer can we carve a path in the wilderness of our days. Only through prayer can we journey through the valley of the shadow of death, having no fear for what lies ahead. For we know and believe that even when it is not apparent, God's love for us remains unchanged and unchanging. Even when God is silent, God's love for us is with us in our going out and in our coming in. Even when our doubts distress us, God's love is still there making sure we do not lose heart. In the letter to the Hebrews, the writer says, we are not among those who shrink back and so are lost, but we are among those who have faith and so are saved. And so I say to you today, have faith, 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 and see what great things God will do.